Good morning. Do I have your attention after that uh, pretty impressive video? I mean, that's some, that's some intense stuff. If you have a pulse, you notice that video. It grabbed your attention. So what I want to ask you today, though, is, is what did you notice? What grabbed your attention when you walked in the door? Uh, maybe it was uh, maybe it was an old friend, or or maybe you're you're less comfortable in church, and for you it was it was the exits. You were you were looking for how how the fastest way to leave this church was, or or if you're a parent, it, it might have been the changing tables or, or something like that. You know, for me, it was the coffee at the back. You see, I'm a pastor, so I love coffee, and I'm a Mennonite, and so you had my attention at free. <laughs> if if you chatted with me before I got my coffee this morning, I was probably just bobbing my head, nodding along, acting as if I cared, but really I was just thinking coffee, coffee, coffee. As soon as I walked in, it grabbed my attention. Whatever that is, you, you gravitate towards it. You notice that whatever else you're doing, you're focused on it. You know, have you ever walked into a, a friend's house and you saw this, this ugly couch or ugly painting or, or unfinished wall or, or something and it grabbed your attention. You walked in and as soon as you walked in, it grabbed your attention. But you know that your friend no longer sees it. Maybe for the first few weeks your friend saw it and now they no longer do it. And you're wondering, how can you not see that ugly couch? I bought a house in Winnipeg several years ago and, and I had it for three years before I sold it. And I never replaced the baseboards. I took them off to redo the carpet, and I never put the baseboards back on. It's the weirdest thing. It bothered me for about three weeks, and then I no longer saw it. I mean, baseboards being off is a noticeable thing, but I'd only think about it maybe the few hours before some friends would be coming over. And I'd think, oh, I should have replaced the baseboard. But day to day, I never noticed it wouldn't grab my attention. See, some things, they grab our attention and won't let go, and some things lose our attention and then barely register. When you're, when you're driving, you're always taught in driver's ed to not look at the cars that are passing you or that you're passing, but rather look at the road where you want to go. You see, there's a tendency to drift where we're looking. Whatever has our attention tends to determine where we're driving. And so you don't want to look at the cars that you're passing. You tend to drift in that direction. I had a friend uh, who was a bit of a hothead, a bit of a temper, and, uh, and drives fairly aggressively. A car came merging on from the right lane, cut him off, quite, quite a close call, and then, and then swerved into the left lane on, on his other side. And he was mad, and he wanted his license plate, and, and I don't know if he was going to report the guy for cutting him off. I mean, I don't think the police really cared about that. But, but he wanted the license plate, and so he was... He was staring at the license plate so intently, he drifted into the other lane. And he, he sideswiped another car, and he caused massive damage to his car and the other car. It was all his fault. But, but the point was, he was looking at the car in the left lane, and he drifted in that way. Speaking of attention, if you've been paying any, you will remember that what we've been saying is that it's your direction, not your intention, that determines your destination. This is the, the principle of the path series. This is the final one. And we've been saying it's your direction that determines where you end up, not where you meant to go, what you hoped about, what you prayed about, what you thought about. It's as simple as where you point your vehicle, you will go. But I want to add something. And it's so simple and it's so obvious that maybe you've forgotten about this. Like that friend with the ugly couch, you just sort of forgot that this principle was true and operating in your life. But you've noticed it. Here's what it is. Your attention determines your direction. What's grabbed your attention determines where you steer. And where you steer determines where you end up. There's this interesting sociological experiment. Uh, a bunch of people went around, they divided up these housewives into two groups. And to the one group, they came and asked if they would put up a, a very large, ugly, drive carefully sign. And not surprisingly, almost none of them did. Then they went around to the next group of, of housewives, and they asked them if they'd like to sign a petition about the, uh, the dangers of, of safe driving, or the dangers of, of dangerous driving. And the women signed. Then they asked them, 
if they'd like to put up a sign in their in their front yard, the same ugly drive careful sign, and most of them did. You see, getting their attention, just even briefly, in a short little time span, on thinking about the dangers of driving stupidly and the, the potential benefits of driving carefully, actually had a big shift in, in the direction of their yard's life. That's a small deal, right? It's a small deal. But what we're saying is, if you can keep your eyes on the road of life, everything will be fine, you'll end up where you want to go. And everything would be fine if there were no distractions. See, I remember walking to a friend's house in my grade 12 year, and it was an ISCF small group in his basement, and I walked in, and as soon as I did, I saw that girl. See, I'd been happily single, content in my life, things had been going well, looking up. I was, I was really enjoying my life, but, but I walked in, and I saw destiny. And, and her smile, and I chatted with her for a few seconds, and everything, everything in my life from that moment on changed direction in an instant. And it changed because someone grabbed my attention. Now that was a good thing, right? That was a positive thing. But flash forward a few years, I was uh, 20 or 21, and I was getting married. And you know what happened? I had a few things on my line. I was, I was a full-time student. And I was working about half time. I was uh, first trying to get married, then I was married, and trying to plan a wedding and all that. And, and so four things had grabbed my attention. They, they were grades, my friends, my wife, and definitely money was a big one. And all four of them had grabbed my attention and determined my destination. You see, the fifth thing that was not on that list, that should have been on the list, was my health. And I was working almost around the clock, either on my schooling or my work or, or spending time with my wife. And I ended up with mono. I ended up flat on my back in bed for, for almost three months. And I spent more than a year getting my health back to where it was before. You see, my, my destination was determined by my direction. But my direction was determined by what had my attention. And you can see this in the words we use to describe the phenomenon grabs or, or captured or, or hooked. These are not emotionally neutral words, right? These words don't just describe something, they make you feel something, right? Grabbed, captured, hooked. When things grab your attention, you feel different. And that's not surprising because we don't make our decisions in an emotionally neutral environment either. I mean, you go to a mall or, or you watch TV or, or you, you go to buy a car, right? Sales understands how to grab your attention, and it's not just through facts, but it's by causing you to feel something. And you know how this goes. When you have this conversation with yourself, you know, I shouldn't do this. Yeah, but maybe I'll, I'll take a little sneak peek. And, no, no, I really, I really shouldn't do this. This is a bad thing. And, and well, maybe I just I check it out. I, I want to see what it, what it feels like. And then your common sense gets railroaded by whatever has your attention. Or whatever you're fixated on. And so I want to sum up today the principle of the path with these three words. Attention, direction, destination. Whatever has your attention determines your direction, which determines where you end up. So what do you wish you paid attention to? What is the thing in your life you wish you paid more attention to? Your, your grades, or, or like me, your health, or or maybe your finances, but you, you all have things you wish you paid attention to in the past than that you're paying for right now. Maybe you wish you developed a deeper relationship with God in, in a time of peace, and now you're in a time of turmoil, and you don't have that depth of relationship like you wanted. Or we can look at this, this question a different way. What do you wish your parents had paid more attention to? Maybe your college fund. Maybe uh, you wish they paid more attention to their own relationship because their own relationship suffered, and because of that, you suffered. You see, I'm bringing up this whole thing about your parents because as soon as I start calling you on what you pay attention to, somebody inevitably tells me it's none of my business because it's my choice. But you know, and I know, and as soon as we talk about your parents, it becomes obvious that you don't make your decisions in a vacuum. The decisions you make affect you and those in your close family circle and friend circle and all those around you. 
It's, it's a whole circle of influences. And you see this as soon as you look at what your parents should have paid attention to, but didn't. So if this is such a big thing, if this is so serious, and we can all agree on, on the level of seriousness, why is it so easy to get it distracted? There's a phrase you probably haven't heard since, at least since you turned 18, if not before that. But yet, it, it works in the background of your life at all times. Pay attention. Pay att you probably heard this a lot growing up. I, I was a bit of a loud mouth. I was a, um, a big talker. I was always talking in class, and I was always distracting other people. And, and I, I could get by in my grades you know, without studying too hard, so I was always the one distracting people. So I heard pay attention a lot growing up. Why pay? You ever thought of that? Why pay? See, pay implies cost. Pay implies a price. And when you pay something, you expect something back of equal or greater value. When you pay something, you'd be disappointed if you didn't get something of value back. And so here we are at the crux of today. This right here is the, the moment, the point on which the whole principle of the path will pivot. It's the dynamic of capture versus pay. You see, some things in your life will try to capture your attention. Uh, you know, maybe girls, or, or cars, or promotions, or success, or whatever it is will try to capture your attention. Other things we have to pay attention to. And it's that tension that we're forced to deal with in a hundred ways each day. And what we, what we choose to pay attention to grows in focus in our life, or what captures our attention grows in focus in your life. And you've probably noticed, if you've lived even somewhat self-aware, that the important things tend to require payment, and the bad things tend to require or tend to capture our attention. This isn't always the case, as I mentioned before. I mean, destiny captured my attention, but our our growing relationship over the years and the health of our relationship required an investment. It required me to pay attention. Yeah, the capture principle helped in the beginning, but very quickly the pay principle had to take over or our relationship would have been short-lived. If you have teenagers, or you've worked with teenagers even a little bit, you've seen this principle in the way they, you discipline them. You see, the way they roll their eyes at you captures your attention. It'll probably infuriate you. It, it causes you to, to have a trouble focusing on something else. But you need to pay attention to their true feelings, how they really feel, to, to steady, loving discipline. And so what captures your attention and what you, you pay attention to, they're, they're different. But always in the background, they're distractions trying to lure you away. Uh, in Deuteronomy, uh, you see this, this principle at, at work. See, the, the Israelites had been in slavery for many, many years. And God had freed them. And they were wandering through the desert for a long time, and he'd been working with, with hammering out that slavery mentality, that they just did what they were told by whoever was around them, and he was growing them and developing them to his children. It was a whole relational process. But here in Deuteronomy 7, they're on the verge of entering into the promised land. And you see, after this point in time, they're going to be surrounded by success and by, by fields that produce great fruit and by cities and by wealth and and they're going to have all sorts of distractions all around them. It won't just be God and the Israelites in the desert. And so this is what God says just before they enter the promised land. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore to your ancestors. Now, whatever you believe, if you're not a Christian, if you came here by accident, if you came here because you were forced to, if you came here because somebody tricked you, whatever, I get it. You, you don't believe everything in the Bible. That's fine. But I know one thing about you. You believe something. You have an opinion, a belief. You have a, a, a standard you hold yourself to, whether it's the Christian biblical standard or not. Here's what else I know about you. You don't always follow that standard. You get distracted from whatever that standard is easily. So in that, already, you agree with at least one thing the Bible talks about, in that you need to pay attention to whatever you've decided to do, or you will tend to drift. But here's where the Bible has, has some sort of value that trumps just some general belief, because the Bible tells you how to manage this and how to grow in this. You see, from Proverbs, 
425, Solomon wrote this. He said, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Now, I don't know exactly why it is, but the distractions seem to always be to your left and to your right. And the way you want to travel always seems to be forward. And so as long as your gaze is straight forward, you're going to, you're going to be able to stay on the path you chose. But when you start looking to the left and to the right, things begin to capture your attention and cause you to drift. We saw that air race video earlier. It was very fascinating. You see, you're flying at, at 360 kilometers an hour. At, at the lowest points, maybe only 20 feet off the ground. And you're flying through these pylons. And at 360 kilometers an hour, you have less than 8 feet on either side of the wing to fly through these pylons. Right? And what happens is, as you're whizzing by, you can't look at the pylons, or you're going to tend to drift towards them. And at 360k, with 8 feet, there's not a large margin of error. So what the air race pilots do is they pick a point way out in the horizon, and they stare at that point because they know as long as they're staring at that point, they'll make it through the pylons safely. But as soon as they glance, if they ever glance at those pylons, they fly right into it. This principle is talked about in the Bible again and again and again, and Jesus picks this up in Matthew. And so we see in, in Matthew 6, verses 22 and 23, Jesus says it this way. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And, and what he's saying is this is in the time before electricity. And so they would hold an actual lamp in front of them. Maybe they put on a stick, you know, a couple of feet in front of them, and they would use that as a guiding post for, for where they would walk at night. And what he's saying is your eyes are like that lamp of your body. And whatever you illuminate will tend to be what you walk towards. And whatever you look at with your eyes tends to be what you will walk towards. But if you, if you keep moving to the left and to the right with your lamp, checking stuff out all on the other sides of the path, you're going to tend to trip up on the path you're on and be distracted by what's on the sides. What Jesus is essentially saying is, as your attention goes, so goes your life. As your attention goes, so goes your destination. Peter, one of the disciples of Jesus, one of his close disciples, uh, he experienced this up close and personal. See, Jesus is walking on water. This is like one of these huge, classic, set-piece miracles that Jesus does that shows off his, his tremendous power and authority as a son of God. And Peter, he, he gets excited. He says, says Jesus, that's you. Then, then, then call me out to walk on the water, and I'll walk on the water too. And Jesus calls him out, and he comes up, and he walks on the water. Like, this is huge. This is massive. This is the sort of thing you'd think that if I only saw this miracle, Surely, I'd be able to follow God the rest of my life. But in verse 30, here's what we read. But when he, being Peter, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. When he saw the wind. You see, Peter stopped looking at Jesus. And he started looking at the wind and the waves around him. And the distractions caused him to drift. And, and when we start to drift, you don't end up somewhere good. When, when a boat is cut adrift, it rarely ends up where it wants to go. It almost always ends up somewhere bad. In, in, in the air race, back to that, that Red Bull air race, what you saw was, was some knife edge flying. And that's the, the blue pylons you have to fly through completely horizontal. You get docked points if you're more than two degrees off the horizontal. But the red pylons, you fly through vertically on your side. And if you're more than two degrees off vertically, you get docked points. But anybody who knows anything about flying knows that your lift comes from your wings. So as soon as your knife edge flying, you lose altitude. You start to drift downward. And you start to drift, and it gets very dangerous because that ground is only about 15, 20 feet below you, and you are flying very fast. And so they have to tip themselves up just before they, they rotate to the vertical. And that allows them some room to drift through those goalposts. So here's the question I want to ask you. Has anything grabbed or captured your attention lately that wasn't there before? Is there anything new in your life now that takes up a significant amount of your attention that wasn't there just recently? Or is there anything that you were given private attention to 
that, if it became public, would be embarrassing or worse. What's grabbed your attention? Let, let's look at this a different way. What is your spouse or kids competing for your attention with? If I asked your wife or your kids what, what they felt like they were competing for your attention with, what would she or them say? What are people warning you with that you get defensive over? What's dividing your attention at work, at home, at church, right now? What are you distracted with? Let's put this a different way. Is there something or someone shouting for your attention but not getting it? Are you avoiding someone? Are you not finding time for your kids, for God, quiet time, the gym? What about your marriage? You see, culture argues that once you say, I do, you can just hit autopilot and coast. But coasting is a lot like drifting, and as we said before, drifting is rarely good. You rarely end up where you want to end up by drifting. Is, is this you? Is, is this your marriage? If attention determines your destination, where is your marriage headed? If what you're paying attention to right now is where you ended up, is your marriage going to end somewhere good or is it going to drift somewhere bad? Or what, what about the spiritual development of your kids or yourself? Are you hoping a half hour of Sunday school or a half hour of a sermon at church will fill up your tank? And you're hoping to ride the other hours of the week on your own. See, small and preventative maintenance, like oil changes for your car, or tire changes for your car, are so much more effective than massive overhauls when you run into a problem. And look, the point is that I want to make is you don't have to be yanked around by your emotions. You can choose. You can see this principle and you can leverage this principle and you can be free from being uh, stuck adrift and stuck coasting. You control your own actions. Have you ever wondered why your parents used to overreact to some of your choices? Maybe you're a parent now and you're the one overreacting to your kids' choices. Have you ever wondered why, what, when you see your kid hanging out with someone new who's maybe not a good influence, you tend to overreact? And that's because parents, they respond to where their kids are heading, not where their kids are. Parents know that what grabs the wheel of their kids' attention eventually will steer their kids' life. Let me re-say that. We all know that what grabs the wheel of our attention will eventually steal our life. Are there people in your life who are overreacting right now? What do they see that you can't? Is there an ugly couch in your life right now that you're blind to that everyone else sees? Look, we're winding this, this whole series up. And, and we, we want to get ourselves out of here with the ability to, to act on these principles and not just think these are good principles, but be stuck to repeat the same mistakes we've been in day in and day out. And I want to end with one verse, one little verse in Hebrews in the New Testament that I think sums us up as perfectly as could possibly be done. It's in chapter 2, verse 1. It says, Therefore we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard, lest we drift away from it. And there's our word again, a pay attention. You see, God, as in God, as in, as in the creator of the world, as in the sustainer of your life, as in the one who wrote the Bible, who sent his son, that God cares about not just where you are, but where you're heading. He cares about you. He cares about what you're doing, about how you're spending your time, about who you spend your time with. He cares about your health, your finances, your relationships. He cares about all of that. And if you agree on with him, on nothing else, it's that where you are heading is important to you and to your happiness. Look, by now you already know that what, what that little shifts in your attention need to be made. You've already thought about the things that have grabbed your attention that aren't healthy, or areas that need your attention that aren't getting it. What I want to remind you with, what I want to end with today is, as your attention goes, so goes your life. What has your attention? What are you focusing on? And where do you want to end up?